Daniel, uh, Reuters Bureau Chief in India and Nepal. Um, we talked a lot about the hard assignments that he's been on in Afghanistan, Pakistan, East Africa, Nepal, India. I have a pretty tough assignment today, um, which is describing the man. Um, how do you describe a man who's been a journalist for the past 15 years? Um, someone who, as he mentioned at lunch, has been shot at twice uh, in Afghanistan. Um, I mean, I, I really struggled with this. Um, and I, in the end, the best I could come up with is, uh, he's our Barkhadat, just male and British. Uh, uh, but, I mean, the comparison is valid. I mean, he's, he's, Simon is dear to us for the same reasons that Barkha is. Um, a fearless journalist, fearless in the face of calamity. They dare to go into places that we don't. Um, shining a spotlight on events that really defines the world for us. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background um, on Simon. Um, he landed in, a, in Islamabad after 9-11 and later rolled into Afghanistan after the fall of the Taliban to drive international coverage of one of the biggest stories in recent history. He um, has been the Reuters bureau chief in India and Nepal for the past three years. Um, he's been a very keen observer of the subcontinent. Um, he's, in fact, he's re recently published a book called Foreign Correspondent, 50 Years of Reporting South Asia. Um, he has really revolutionized the way in which Reuters covers India's social and economic transformation. Uh, this might be obvious um, to some of you who have been following the news really quite clearly really clued into what, what's going on. Um, Simon, a few of the highlights, he's won um, the Reuters Award um, for the best general news story in 2003 for an interview that he did with General Musharraf, a man who's interview, who, he, who he has interviewed twice. Um, he also covered the landmark elections in Bhutan and Nepal. Um, coming face to face with Prachanda, the Mao's leader of Nepal, the king and many others. Um, in fact, uh, one of the coolest text messages I've ever received in my life was one he sent me two days ago. Uh, it said very briefly, Hey Jayadev, off to Nepal to cover the king's last press conference. Be back on Thursday. Uh, my reaction was, damn. <laughs> I want that job. I want to fly to Kathmandu on Tuesday and go to Google on Friday. Um, so, uh, please uh, join me in welcoming Simon Denya, um, head of Reuters in India, a fearless journalist and a true witness to history. Please, thank you. Thanks, Jared. I hope I live up to that uh, introduction, very flattering introduction. Um, thanks, everybody. Um, okay, um, yeah, so. What, what Jaidev asked me to talk about today was my life as a foreign correspondent, a um, pretty broad topic. Uh, I'll make some remarks, uh, speak for a bit, um, a little bit about the world outside Google. I know you're living in this little bubble called Google here. And I, I'm, I'd be concerned about the rest of the world. Um, and then hopefully we'll open it up to questions. So uh, I'm happy to talk about anything that, that, that comes up really. Uh, what it's like being a foreign correspondent, um, what I think about journalism, and uh, some of the stories that I've done. I'll talk a bit about those subjects first, and then we can just we can just chat. Keep it pretty informal. Um, yeah, I mean, what? How do I? How do I start? I, I was going to start actually by, by kind of looking back at the history of being a foreign correspondent and how it's changed. You know, Two hundred years ago, news from India took four months travel by ship from Calcutta round the Cape of Good Hope and arrive in Falmouth in Cornwall. Um, on the 9th of May 1857, something that uh, British people know as the mutiny and you know as the first war of independence broke out. Um, by then, the Suez Canal was open, but it still took five weeks for that news to reach London. Um, today, I'm in the business of trying to tell people news tell people what's happening in seconds, as 
fast as you can Google it, we're reporting it. So, um, and we're literally timed against our competitors to the second. We put out news alerts and uh, things we call snaps, 80 characters in capitals in red, big thing, something big has happened, election results, bombs gone off, um, and we're expected to win 70% of those times. We're expected to be ahead of our key competitors seven times out of 10. Um, so that's the pressures of the way that the world is changing. Um, the, first, the first foreign correspondent to arrive in India was coincidentally that I know of to be posted here full time was a Reuters guy in 1865, just after the cable was laid uh, to India. Uh, a guy called a 22 year old who dropped out of school at the age of 16 called Henry Collins. And his first office was a tent on the Esplanade in Bombay. Um, that's kind of where it started. He started doing news for businesses in Mumbai, prices, simple information, and sending news back to, uh, to Britain. Uh, what he started turned into a Reuters operation which is uh, now employs more than 60 correspondents in India, photographers, and, and, a, and an online team also running our website. Um, and what he started led to an absolute explosion of interest in India. Um, even in, even in uh, well, 13 years after he arrived, there was huge interest in Britain, in, in news from India. Reuters was determined that it would really supply that news. So it sent every day a telex of 77 words of news from India. I mean, I dread to think every minute how many words of news from India go out today to the world. Um, anyway, um, yeah, there are hundreds of foreign journalists in India now, the number's growing all the time. Um, and as I say, we're under pressure to tell the world a lot about India, and we're under pressure to tell the world very fast about what's going on here. So, what does it mean to be a foreign correspondent in India? Um, as Jaido said, what it meant this week was getting a call at 6 o'clock on Tuesday night to be told, the King's giving a press conference! You've got to get there! Finding the flights were all completely booked. There's one flight, Cosmic Air, you know, the most unreliable airline in the world. <laughs> and we found them, but they're like, no chance, mate. Forget it. You're not going to get it. So, yeah. so I thought, well, okay, but I just better get my passport anyway. Two hours searching the house, I can't find my passport, you know, <laughs> starting to panic. Um, anyway, 11.30 at night, we finally got where we were going to get seats on the plane. So, great, we have to phone this guy at 8 o'clock in the morning, it's all going to happen, it's all going to be fine. Of course, the guy we have to phone at 8 o'clock in the morning and his phone turned off, you know, until 9 o'clock in the morning. And, anyway, I got on the plane, it's all fine, we get to the palace, no one's letting you in. Some people have got in, some people haven't, there's 100 journalists outside crushing me against the gates of the palace, trying to get in the palace. And I was, yeah, I mean it was, uh, I was kicked in the back about 10 times. <laughs> um, but in the end I got there, and I sat, um, as far as I am to you, uh, away from the king, uh, on the floor in front of him. And he spoke about his experience of running the country, and he spoke about the massacre. And it was a very, uh, exciting moment watching history unfold and it was worth getting kicked in the back quite a few times to see it. Um, so, what's journalism about? In my opinion, what journalism about is about is getting out there. It's not sitting in the office with your preconceived ideas. It's not picking up the phone or looking on the internet, frankly. It's about getting out there and talking to people. And it's getting out there and talking to as many people as you can with an open mind and really trying to find out what's going on. Because every time you do go out there, you find stuff you never imagined. There's always stuff that surprises you. In person, you meet somebody, you get, if you phone them up, you get what you expected them to say. If you meet them, they tell you something you didn't know. Um, so that's what I tell the reporters who, who I work with. Get out of the office all the time. Um, as I say, it's, it's keeping an open mind when you do go out. 
and it's never being quite satisfied. It's always thinking there's one more person you could talk to. There's one more angle you haven't thought of. Um, there's somebody else interesting who can give you a perspective on the story that you didn't have. Um, it's about, well, I hesitate to use the word cynical, but it's about questioning everything that you, that you hear, whether it's a politician or an activist. Uh, everybody's got an agenda, and we have to try, as journalists, to get past that and try and find out, what, as I say, what's really happening on the ground. Um, it's a strange profession, too, because I believe passionately in good journalism. I think it's tremendously important. Um, I think it's an absolutely vital part of democracy. But I can't say that it's always practiced very well by some of the people who share the same profession as me. Um, you know, tell a good story because it sells papers, even if it's not true. Tell a party line, flatter someone to get access to them, sensationalize, make it up. You know, it happens all the time, even you know as well as I do. You're, you're, you're consumers of the media. I mean, I used to work in Africa for four years, and I came back to uh, London to do a hostile environment course. Of course, they give you about, about how to survive when you know, people want to shoot at you. And um, <laughs> the answer, by the way, is jump, get, get on the ground. That's the only thing they teach you for a whole week. Just get on the ground. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, so I picked up the Sun newspaper, not a paper that's, I don't know if you know the Sun, but it's a, a particularly um, sensationist British tabloid. And not a paper that has an awful lot of foreign news in it, but it had, had a news story about Africa. The, the, the fugitive former Prime Minister of, Fode, of Sierra Leone, uh, Fode Sankara, wanted for human rights abuses, war crimes, you, you name it, he, he was wanted for it. Uh, this was a time when there were British troops in Sierra Leone. He'd been, he'd been captured in a daring raid by the British, brave British soldiers in his jungle hideout in Sierra Leone. Our boys had gone in and mounted this great operation. Bolesanko was picked up in the capital, <laughs> based on information received from a Sierra Leonean informant, and he was arrested by the Sierra Leonean police. There were no British troops. There was no jungle hideout. It was all made up from beginning to end. And without even picking up the phone to make it up, right? Just made up by somebody who had no interest in trying to tell people what really happened. Just, I don't know, I, I, I still kind of wonder. And that happens all the time. The sun does this regularly. Um, so, we try not to do that, Reuters. We try to be accurate and impartial uh, and fast. And increasingly for me, um, as I said, try to get into things in a bit of depth. Um, so yeah, questioning people, questioning those in authority and power, we do quite a lot of that too, and I think that's an important duty. Um, sometimes we get, in, we, you know, we get in trouble, you know, what's these foreigners coming over to this country, criticizing our country, you know, we're always reporting negative news from India, what's going on, you know? What have you got in, you got in for us, you know? Colonial bastards. <laughs> um, <laughs> My only response to that um, is that if politicians are stealing, if they're lying, if they're killing people, then our duty is to the people who they're stealing from, the relatives of the people who they're killing, the, the people who they're cheating. And it's our duty to question those people. Um, sometimes that means that you're writing negative stories, but uh, our duty is to the people of India, not necessarily to people in authority in India. There is a, there is a difference. Um, I don't actually, I mean, I think there is a perception, of course, that journalists only tell bad news, but, but a colleague of mine came over, my, my deputy, he'd been living in the States for a while, he came to India um, about a year ago. And he'd been a consumer of foreign, foreign correspondents writing about India. Uh, and when he got to Delhi, he was like, Where's all the malls? Where's all the wealth? Where's all the Google offices? <laughs> There's all this poverty. I mean, so he got a, an image of India, which was of the changing India, actually, of, of India shining. Um, 
and he was kind of amazed that those uh, stories, there were still stories of the old India, if you like, that the old India was still very visible. Um, so maybe maybe we don't all, we don't only do negative stories. Um, what's it like? Um, it, it's, at times it's, it's infuriating to be a foreign correspondent, to have to deal with the, the Bangladeshi press officer who will not give you the visa to go into the country because he is worried that you're going to report bad things about Bangladesh. So he notices what your phone number is and he doesn't answer the phone when you phone him. When you phone his phone number. So then you trick him, you phone him from another mobile phone <laughs> or another number. And he answers it and he pretends to be somebody else. <laughs> It's, it's, it's infuriating when you go to Pakistan and Kashmir and minders follow you around. You can't talk to anybody without two people sitting to your left and right, staring at the people you're talking to, making damn sure that they give you the right message. It's about man minders in Manipur doing the same thing happening when you go to, to the northeast of India, not being able to get permission to go outside in Bali, not being able to get permission to go to Arunachal Pradesh. I still haven't got permission to go to Arunachal Pradesh. When the government sees this, I probably never will. Um, <laughs> I, I did get permission, funnily and unfortunately, to, to go to the Nicobar Islands after the tsunami, to go to the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Um, and you need permits to go there, and it's very rare for our journalists to be given those permits. Um, so, but anyway, a trip was organized by the Navy by the Coast Guard, and they took us off on this ship. It was mainly Indian journalists, so I was the only foreign representative of a foreign agency who we went. Um, uh, and uh, so we got to, I forget which one it was, might have been Karni, uh, but I'm not sure. We get there, and we say, well, we want to speak to some, some victims, some people who suffered in the tsunami. And uh, so they said, okay, fine. So they got the chair out. Got this guy out to talk to me and tapped two chairs down in the shade. And as I sat down, 12 other people sat around us the officials of the camp, the naval officers, the army officers, everybody. And I'm like, how can I talk to this guy in front of all of you? What's he going to tell me? He can't tell me anything. Even if he told me the aid effort in the Anglo and the Nikbar, it was amazing and the army was great. I couldn't use it if he said it to me in front of you. So, I had to, I just got up and walked away, and I went around the camp to try and talk to people away from them. And the, the guy who was running the tour, the, the naval commander, I mean, absolutely panicked, came up to me as I was sitting down to, to, to do my first interview. The helicopter's leaving, we've got to go, we've got to go. We're going to leave you here, you can't get stuck here. Sure. Um, anyway, I dug my heels in, and... Uh, I talked to people, and the helicopter didn't take off, because they sure as hell weren't going to leave me there. Um, and uh, it turned out, of course, that the, the aid effort in the Andaman Islands and Nicobar Islands was, had been a shambles, actually. Um, and, and it had been very good in the mainland in Tamil Nadu, by, by all accounts, but in, in the Nicobar Islands, because of geography and because of bad bureaucracy, it really hadn't worked at all. Um, so it's about those people trying to stop you telling the story, and it's about having the determination to make sure that despite those things, you do go out there and tell the story. That's what I try and tell people, and that's what that's what I try and do. Um, but, hang on, let me try and... Sorry, I'll try and... Yeah, I mean, I, I just put some, some pictures together in a bit of a hurry, um, because as I said, I was in Kathmandu this week, but... I want to stress as well, journalism is, can be, an enormously uplifting thing to do. Um, you know, I've covered Nepal for four years. I've covered its journey from intractable civil war, from a vicious Maoist insurgency, um, a royal power grab, and then an amazing transformation. Pro-democracy protests and the king standing down, and on April the 10th this year, democracy coming back to Nepal, the first elections in nine years. And I can tell you, 
covering those elections in Nepal made the whole thing worthwhile. I mean, there were women who'd walked several hours, three hours, at least three hours, in the sun, in their best clothes, with their umbrellas and shields. They were so enthusiastic about casting their vote. It was, it was great, you know? And you can, you can um, I mean, as an aside, it just, I'm a real believer, I think after six years in South Asia, I'm a real believer in democracy. You, you can, you can criticize Indian democracy all you want, but you can be damn sure that without democracy, um, this place would be in an awful lot worse shape than it is. And uh, I feel the same about Nepal. This was a chance when people had the chance to vote for peace. And they came out and they voted for peace with such hope and optimism. It was, it was inspiring. I mean, a 92-year-old woman, she was, she was bent double with age. I mean bent double. She was, she was like, her head was here, right? And she had come, she'd struggled with her grandsons in the polling booth to vote for a, a peaceful future for my grandchildren. So it was, it was just like, that, and all of that other stuff was worthwhile. And so, someone asked me earlier, don't you get cynical covering all this stuff? And yet, when you cover things like that, the answer is no, actually. Um, you actually have some hope and some faith in human nature. But then, I'm going to now show you a photograph which, frankly, goes this is Haryana. This is a 21-year-old girl. She's seven months pregnant. That's her boyfriend next to her. And as you can see, uh, they've been killed by their own family members and by villagers in what is rather horribly called an honor killing. Um, and in this village where this happened, I spoke to the villagers and I spoke to the family members, her, members of her family, her cousins. And what was shocking was every single one of them was immensely proud of what they'd done. They, were, they felt that the blot had been removed from the village and the village's honour had been restored because these people had been strangled, taken from their house at 5.30 in the morning and strangled to death. Um, and you know what they'd done wrong? It wasn't, they weren't married, but that wasn't the issue. The issue was that she'd fallen in love with this boy at school and they were from the same village. And in Haryana, you can't marry someone from the same village. It's, it's just not on. It doesn't happen. Everyone said, oh, they're like brother and sister because they're from the same village. So I thought, oh, something to do with keeping the gene pool fresh. You know, you can't, you've got to keep, you know, that's the reason. Except when I started talking to people who were experts in this. And then they said, actually, the reason on the killing picking up in Haryana is because in 1956 or 57, India passed inheritance laws, and women were allowed, daughters were allowed to inherit the land of their fathers. And if this girl had stayed in the village with a family from the same village, that the boy's family might have had a claim on her father's land, and the land might have got divided. And so, if she was married off to someone eight villages away, She's safely out of harm's way, and she's never going to come back to the village. But in that village, she might have divided the family there. And whether they were conscious of that was that. And her honor killing is happening, it seems, from what I can gather, uh, all the time. I mean, increasingly frequently in Haryana, and land prices are going up, and it's almost making it. And young people are also seeing what's happening in places like this, and they want to marry people they love. You know? So there's two forces going in opposite directions. Um, but the reason actually was, was a pretty horrible, chilling reason. And, and when I saw this photograph, I actually saw this photograph when I got back from reporting this. And I mean, that moved me as much as, as anything that I've covered in a long time. Um, so, so I want to go back to elections now, because that depresses me that bit. Um, Bhutan, elections in Bhutan, amazing. I mean, great privilege to go to these places and try and understand them. Um, it's a very difficult place to understand Bhutan. Everybody loves the king in Bhutan. I mean, apart from 100,000 refugees who've been kicked out and are in Nepal, but uh, apart from that, everybody loves the king. And they will tell you at great length how much they love the king and how much they didn't really want democracy at all. They really wanted the king stayed around. Um, but then 
The king said, no, you've got to have democracy. We want you to have democracy. So two parties were allowed to be formed. One was the, uh, run by the king's closest advisor. One was run by the, king, the old king's brother-in-law, the brother of the old king's four wives. Um, so what's the choice? You've got a choice between the king's family or the king's best friend, right? Good choice. Anyway, anyway. Every, all the other foreign journalists came in to write this story about Shangri-La and, and how it wasn't a wonderful place and everyone loves a king. Very one-dimensional story. Then the election result came out. And the result was 45 seats for the king's closest advisor and two seats for the king's brother-in-law, who lost in his own constituency to a 36-year-old school teacher with no standing, real standing at all. It's like, What's going on? Something's happening here, right? And, and I was lucky enough, I'd been in the, 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 the King's brother-in-law's constituency the day before, and I'd actually had a chance conversation, and I had an idea of what was happening. Um, turns out the King of Bhutan, the old king, married four women, and the father of, four sisters, I think, and the father of those four sisters had used his new influence to buy up land, throw people off land, get a monopoly of business. And, um, and generally became someone who was extremely unpopular in Bhutan. He wasn't really seen as part of the sacred royal family at all, and he'd come up from, no from nothing. Um, so it turned out the king's in-laws weren't as popular as everybody thought. And when these people stood to vote, they were also enthusiastic about the chance they had to vote. They really believed they were, ha they were they, they, you know, again, like Nicole, they really felt that the chance to vote was something great. And they had a message to tell the king, which is, yeah, we love you, but could you just keep your in-laws in a bit of check, you know? <laughs> um, so, you know, it's surprising sometimes, right? You come across these stories you just didn't expect at all. And you just get out there in the field and you, and, and I mean, these, these stories, are, these are stories about journalism, they're stories about my experiences in South Asia, but it's, this is what, this is what motivates me, doing these stories and finding out what's happening. Um, Sometimes it's a puzzle. I mean, this is this is Nandigram. Somebody cycling through the block roads in Nandigram. This was just after the first set of violence in Nandigram, and before the, the second lot of violence. Um, I spent a lot of time last year going around India doing stories about people being turfed off their land, actually. Uh, San Nandigram and Singur, uh, Lanjigar, where, where Vedanta wanted to build a mine in Orissa. Um, uh, there's a place where Posco want to build a factory in Arisa too. Um, I went to the Namada Valley also before that, where people are being, you know, turfed off their land to make, to make way for a dam. Uh, and, and as I left on one of these trips, someone said to me, oh, uh, one of my Indian colleagues said, I kind of half joke and said, oh, you're trying to undermine India's industrialization. You don't want India to come up, right? You know? And it was kind of a joke, but the truth is, it, they're fascinating stories to cover. They're puzzles because everybody's telling you something different and everybody's got an argument and everybody's bombarding you with facts and figures. Um, but if you get out there, you discover one thing that's very clear, actually, um, which is that these people were being turned off their land under false pretenses. They were being cheated of their land. They weren't being given enough money to settle anywhere else in these places, I don't know, in some places it's happened where, it's, where people have got good money, but in these places they were getting money that wouldn't cover the first major medical bill or the first wedding in the family, and they were getting cheated. And in the old days, maybe a few goons would have come and roughed them up and they'd have gone away and they'd have joined the urban poor somewhere and no one would have been forgotten about. And strangely, something happened in India in the last couple of years, after Kalinganagar and after Nandigram. People started to get, people started to see themselves on 24 hour news channels actually. And they started to develop a consciousness that they weren't alone, that they could stand up and they could protest and they could say no. And they did. Um, and I knew when I, when I made this trip to Nandigram that if the government tried to force them off their land, people would die because these people were prepared to die for their land. And I told everybody home there after that that that's what would happen. And of course, that's exactly what happened. Um, so what I, the lesson I got from that 
for, in, for India, if you like, it's not that people shouldn't be moved on, because of course people do have to make way for, you know, lovely Google offices and mines and whatever, you can't, you know. Um, but, um, but it has to be done in a proper way, otherwise India's going to have a problem, actually. India needs to manage it in a proper way, if these people aren't just going to turn around and say no, um, and then dig their hills in. So, getting out onto the ground really kind of taught me something that perhaps a lot of my colleagues sitting in Delhi, a lot of Indian journalists sitting in Delhi, just saw the story of Nandagram as a story of Buddha Dev against Mamta Banerjee, one politician against another. You know, Mamta was just, you know, she's a bit shrill and whatever, that's, you know, she seen. So, well, we don't really believe her, right? And we all believe Buddha Dev's a nice guy. So that was kind of the way the story was seen. But actually, you get on the ground, it's a completely, it's a completely different story. I'm too enthusiastic. It's a completely different story. It's a completely different story. So, yeah. I'm just trying to, you know, this is just a sense of, of what, what it means to me to be a journalist, um, is doing stuff like that. I mean, there's so many, there are so many stories, there are so many images which stick in my head from, from six years in South Asia. Um, I, I arrived here just before the last elections, actually, in India. Um, and the first thing I did was cover the elections. I covered Advani. I covered the Gandhis around UP. I spoke to, to Sonia and Priyanka and Rahul. I, 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 I'm not, I'm not um, party political in any way, um, but a, a visual image of Priyanka on the roof of her, of her jeep, at, at, under the moonlight, stuck at a railway crossing, and there were people just showering rose petals on her, screaming, Priyanka's in the lab, Priyanka's in the I mean, just one of those images that will always stick in my mind. Um, being at, at Rameshwaram, uh, on the end of Adams Bridge, on the, right on the coast, and watching Sri Lankan refugees come over in little boats and wade with all their possessions through the surf, kind of their possessions on their heads, bags on their heads, and just arrive in this incredibly beautiful spot. I mean, beautiful blue sea and blue sky. And just arrive on dry land and just break down in tears because they got out of Sri Lanka and the horrors of the Civil War. Um, so many things. I, I won't bore you with all of them, but here's a picture of a supermarket. Um, how am I telling you a picture of a supermarket? I sat in that supermarket. It's, it's in Ahmedabad. It's supposed to be the largest supermarket in India. That's what they're saying. Um, I sat in there and I spoke to uh, ordinary, middle-class, professional Indians and Hindus uh, who told me that what happened in Gujarat, the riots and the deaths, was a good thing. It had to happen. The Muslims had to be taught a lesson. They were getting above themselves, they're breathing too fast, and uh, they really needed to be put in their place. And these people volunteered this information. I mean, I didn't even ask for it. And it was, I was in that supermarket, wondering what kind of surreal world I'd come into. And then I went to the, I mean, this may be as controversial, but this is what I, I'm telling you what I experienced. Um, I went to the Muslim ghettos and I met women who'd whose daughters had been raped and whose sons had been killed in that violence. Um, and the contrast between the two was enormously, enormously moving. Um, you know, it's not to be, uh, to be, I mean, I'm, I'm, as I said to you, an enthusiast for India's democracy um, and the good parts of it. I'm an enthusiast for India's secularism. Uh, so I see tremendous amount of positive things about this country and I see them I see them here today. It's amazing. But there are these things which stick in your mind too and, and do move you when you're when you're covering this country. Um, where, am, where am I going now? That's me. That's me. <laughs> Next to the king of Nepal. The rest of the prince of my is gone. Um, um, so um, yeah, I mean, I can talk about a lot of the stories that I've done. I, I, I think I'll kind of save the rest of it and see what, if people have any questions, and then, and then just take it from there. I've given you a kind of an idea, I hope, 
about what I what I believe in in journalism and what it's all about. Um, and uh, and I've got you know happy to talk about my experiences as, as in Pakistan, Afghanistan, here and, and anywhere else. Okay, thanks very much.